Hello and welcome to another edition of Concept Test Kitchen. I know it's been a while since I posted, but I've been working on other things. Um, today I want to talk to you about a slightly more abstract and inclusive model that I'm adapting from E.F. Schumacher and Ken Wilber. Um, I'm finding it increasingly useful in my own thinking about how organizations work and how they don't work. Um, so let's take a, a walk through what is either called the four stories or the four folds. I haven't figured out which is a more inclusive. Um, again, this is not my idea. This is a combination and extension of the ideas of E.F. Schumacher and Ken Wilber. I'm trying to make it more hospitable, so I've adapted their models a little bit, um, so I find it easier to connect and talk to other people about it. So let's take a look. In previous editions of the Concept Test Kitchen, I've used um, a glass marker board and markers to, to sketch out a model. In this case, it makes more sense and it feels more tangible to use an actual object. Um, and this is a folded bit of paper that I carry with me wherever I go to try and figure out why this model might be useful to me and to the cultural managers um, I know and I'm fond of. Um, again, the source material here, most of the heavy lifting was done by E.F. Schumacher in his book, A Guide for the Perplexed, um, one of his last books, an amazing bit of philosophy uh, that's worth a read if you're into philosophy. And then Ken Wilber, many decades later, came up with a similar structure, a framework which he called his AQAL, all quadrants, all levels. Um, the quadrants part of this is what is inspiring this element. The levels come in a level uh, different, um, a, a different framework, which I'll work on later. Um, but here's the basic idea. So I took their models and frameworks. I tried to make them more accessible. They made some adaptions to how they discussed and described these pieces. But here's the basic gist is that in every waking and sleeping moment of our existence as human beings, there are essentially four stories around us um, that we are a part of and we are in. Um, describing them in this way helps us sort of tease out what's going on in the world around us and the world within us. Um, so one way of seeing the universe around us is through individual external objects and individuals. So I can see a single book, I can see another single book, I can see a single person standing in front of me. Uh, there's an individual view of the world that's a really important way that we engage um, with what's around us. At the same time, of course, we understand there's a plural, there's a collective. Uh, there aren't just individual things, but there are systems of things, bundles of things, collective of things, and we know how they are both singular and collective at the same time. So for example, if we see a herd of deer, we can understand how a single deer might behave, and we might understand there's actually a different set of behaviors we might expect from a whole herd of deer. Um, same with individual people or collectives of people. It's not hard for us to switch back and forth between these two ways of viewing the, the world around us. Um, so in a nutshell, there's a singular and a plural, and it's not hard for us to understand how this uh, connects with our world, certainly in organizations. Uh, and in anything else we happen to be doing uh, or thinking at the time. And of course, this leaves out a little bit of uh, a rather significant component of the world. Most of, much of Western thought is built on objective observation of reality, which would be the singular and the plural, the behaviors, the objects, the actions we can, we can see and test and think about objectively. Um, but then there's this other realm, which wouldn't be hard to figure out, and that is the inner um, there's an inner life, both of the singular and the plural, and we can decide, we can describe the world then as having four quadrants that are always ongoing and always, uh, we're in the midst of them. We can't pick one of these. Uh, so again, the outer singular is any individual object or individual we can see and connect with and understand or speak with. The outer plural is any system of objects or behaviors or natural systems that we can see and measure and identify. You can imagine then the inner singular, which is the invisible inner consciousness that I carry with me that you could never see, uh, or the indivi in individual consciousness that you carry with you that I could never see. Uh, and you can imagine even a world where there's a collective, a plural in inner life. Um, if you've ever been in a theater or in a, a social event where there feels like there's a collective consciousness or connection, uh, people sharing something at the same time and space, uh, that would be the inner plural. 
Um, so uh, why I find this useful is because this actually uncovers what is often ignored in management theory and management practice. Um, the bulk of management theory and practice have been up in this section right here. Uh, systems and objects we can observe. Behavior lives on this side, even though intent lives on the inner and hidden. Um, and a lot of the challenges we have in individual relationships are between here, where I have an inner consciousness, I, you have an inner consciousness, which I cannot see except in your behavior and your outward um, appearance. So a lot of individual relationships challenges in institutions and anywhere else come into this problem about the boundary between what is invisible to you and what is invisible to me, and all we have is an uh, outer view of the world. A couple other things that are useful here. So if we, if we wanted to use pronouns, this would be the space we would say I. This is I and me. This is you um, or the external version of me, which is another thing. Uh, this would be they. Uh, the plural outer is the they. Um, groups of people we experience outside of ourselves. And the inner plural is the we, um, the, the collective, the, the, the groups we talk about as being a part of. Um, another way of cutting this would be to say um, this is an intentional space, this is a behavioral space, this is a social space, and this is the cultural space. Uh, culture being the collective inner life of a group or a, a collection of people. Um, and again, so what happens in management is we really talk almost exclusively about the external behavioral aspects of an institution. Um, there's beginning conversations around in the Silicon Valley and elsewhere about bringing your whole self to work, which would be all four quadrants. Um, but the point is you don't actually have a choice. Your whole self is at work. Uh, the question is how connected and directed is that inner self with the outer world available to you? Um, I find this useful, again, in a bunch of ways because to me, actually cultural practice, artistic practice, is in many ways about translating the inner life of the individual and the collective into an outer manifestation, a poem, a performance, a musical piece, a, um, a dance. These are all, in many ways, drawing on what either the individual artist finds within themselves and wants to express into the world, or individual artists in context with each other in a collective or drawing upon and building on their own heritage. Um, taking the inner life and expressing it outwardly. Uh, so if you wanted to run an organization effectively, I don't feel you can ignore um, that there are these four quadrants going on within you and within every human being that you come into contact with within your organization and outside your organization. Uh, and to me, this starts to have an interesting conversation. Um, other interesting elements I found to be useful is um, one is uh, thinking about important elements of arts organizations, like buildings, for example. Uh, you could think of a cultural building, like a theater, a performing arts center, a museum, both as a singular outer, it's an object, it's a thing, it's a building in context with other buildings. You can think of it also as a system. So a building has systems of air conditioning and, and entry and security and uh, spaces, public and private spaces. It's an inner singular, so every individual in that building has an internal reaction or sense of context or place or resonance with that building. And it's an inner collective as well, because um, in a couple of ways, one is the building itself was constructed based on a whole bunch of in internal cultural assumptions about what a building is and does. And they took a lot of in those internal assumptions of the plural inner and made them manifest in a system and in the building itself. Uh, as a really obvious example of this, if you think about a courtroom, um, a courthouse tells you who you are, uh, depending on where you are in the context of that courthouse. Uh, if you're sitting on the raised platform, you're the judge. If you're sitting on one of the tables, you're the um, um, person being accused. If you're sitting in a box to the one side, you're part of the jury. Uh, there's clear delineations, not just uh, in the individual and the collective, external, but they, that, that leads you to think and behave within some internal collective and, um, and singular. Um, and I find uh, actually arts organizations are particularly useful in this model because arts organizations, one would assume, are in the business of fostering and supporting and stewarding and preserving 
the very expressions of the inner singular and collective um, into the outer world, those things that have been made manifest as physical works of art, as uh, objects of performance or expression, as musical um, expressions into the world or dance, as heritage. Um, so uh, I find um, this model is particularly useful to me in, in thinking about the whole system approach to what a cultural organization might be uh, and what cultural organizations might do. So if you assume there are these four stories ongoing, um, there's ways of thinking about organizations to double check whether you've actually considered all four in whatever it is you're doing. Um, other examples would include capital or money. What does money look like when we think about uh, the external singular, the, the dollar itself, the plural, which is the collection of wealth, either within an organization or available to it. The inner singular, so each individual's inner response to money, which is different based on their past experience with money in their family and in their life, and the collective inner experience of money. Um, all of these come into play when you're writing a budget, when you're planning an expenditure, when you're building a capital asset like a building. Um, and I think, again, that's where we have, I think, undervalued the role of the artistic approach and process in understanding how our cultural organizations might work. Um, now, we know institutions are really instrumental. That's their purpose. We created organizations to do something. And when you do something, you're making something manifest in behavior, objects, or actions in the outside observable world. Uh, but in order to do that, they actually draw upon the inner singular of their team and the ex in inner collective of their, again, their, their, their team or their community or their supporters or their constituents. Um, and organizations that are blind to that inner level of what they do, I think, will be continually surprised. Um, and just to close with a great quote by Jeanette Winterson, who speaks about poetry as I'm thinking about this model. And she says, and that is the preserve of poetry and of true fiction, to put roots down through the surface into the subsoil of the human heart and to draw up those elements that would otherwise lie locked there, unheard, unspoken, perhaps unregarded. So I hope this overview of the model at least gives you a first flavor of why it might be useful to think through the frame of four stories or four folds to think for yourself about where each of these things live. Um, and as a final conclusion, um, I entered this frame really to start to understand more effectively what aesthetic meant, uh, because I read a lot about aesthetics, um, the study or the practice of what is beautiful or whole or true. Um, and really what this helps me understand is that aesthetics lives in all four quadrants here. So there is an object so you might imagine, again, a, a poem, a sculpture, a painting, an action of someone on a stage. Um, there's a plural, so that thing in context with other things, multiple dancers, multiple performers or musicians. There's an inner singular, that's where the aesthetic lives, because it, it's my individual and invisible reaction to the object and the context in which I'm experiencing that object or action. And then there's an inner plural, so I'm drawing on that reaction from my entire heritage, my entire experience, uh, the inner life of all those who came before me and all those who are sitting with me. Um, some of that made manifest through behavior and action, but much of it internal um, and invisible. Um, so a cultural organization is an aesthetic enterprise. It creates things of aesthetic worth or beauty or impact or power. Um, so all four of these quadrants come into play when we try and make beauty in the world in ways that are sustainable and engaged um, and can operate over time at scale. I hope this is a helpful overview. I'm gonna try and write and think more about this. I carry this with me so I can keep, keep taking notes um, and I'll keep trying to find ways to make this and related um, frameworks from both of these books accessible to all of you. But in the meanwhile, comment as you like into, in the comments section. I'd love to hear whether and how this resonates with you whether it seems completely superfluous uh, or whether it connects already to something that you know to be true in some other language. Thanks very much, and um, I'll talk to you soon.